Amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, if you'll turn with me to Genesis chapter number four, and we're going to pick off where we pick up where we left off this morning, Genesis chapter number four, as we begin looking this morning at the life outside the Garden of Eden, and we continue that tonight as we see what happens when uh, people turn away from God, when they uh, flee from the presence of God. We see what type of society. It gets into, I don't know if we'll be able to get all that I'm, I'm uh, planning tonight. We'll see how far we can go tonight. But uh, just a little recap of this morning. We saw where Adam and Eve had a child named Cain. And then they had na- another child named Abel. And, uh, of course, Cain was a uh, farmer, a tiller of the ground. Abel was a keeper of the sheep. He was a shepherd. And they both brought an offering unto the Lord. Uh, Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. Abel brought of the firstling of his flock. And of the fat thereof, the Lord had respect unto Abel his offering, but unto Cain and his offering, uh, God did not have respect. He didn't come the right way, didn't bring it the right way. And, uh, of course, we've seen this. Abel brought it by faith. He brought it uh, with a good heart, with a right heart. He brought a a blood sacrifice. And uh, no doubt they had been taught this by Adam and Eve, their parents. They had been taught what offerings to bring. And, And maybe this was the first time that Adam and Eve had allowed Cain and Abel to bring an offering on their own. Uh, what were their ages at this time? The Bible really doesn't tell us. It's mere speculation, perhaps late teens, early 20s, I don't know. But it's perhaps the first time they had done this. And uh, remember, Cain brought his offering, and, and God rejected that offering. He didn't so much condemn Cain at the time, but he rejected the offering. And Cain got very mad. His anger burned. His anger glowed. It showed on his face what was in his heart. And so uh, he was mad at God because God had not accepted his offering, but he was mad at Abel because God had accepted Abel's offering and not his. And so that anger burned within him. And remember, God came to him and and told him, said, "Uh, Cain, if you do the right thing, your offering is going to be accepted. But if you do not do the right thing, then sin's uh, crouching at your door, at your your sin's heart, it's ready to uh, pounce on you, and it's ready to control you and, and take over you and attack you and destroy you. But remember, Cain didn't listen. Cain was silent there in verse number 7. He didn't listen to God. He refused God's mercy and grace and love. He refused God's forgiveness. He refused to repent of his sin. And so that sin took over in his heart, and that anger came out. And and he took took Abel out into a field and really deceived him by taking him out there. And then he rose up and he slew him. He killed him. And the word slew uh, means a brutal killing, that he killed his brother Abel. And you see many times the word thy brother is mentioned in the scriptures which makes it uh, even worse, so to speak. So Cain's the first murderer. He's the first child born, but his first murderer, the first murderer in human history, and Abel the first person to die physically. And that was God's promise. God told Adam, said, the day you sin, you're going to die. Of course, Adam and Eve had not died physically at that time, but they were already beginning to reap the benefits, so to speak, of their sin and their rebellion in the garden. Uh, Even though they had not died yet, they were seeing this. Their youngest son had been killed by their uh, by their oldest son, and then their oldest son's going to be expelled. He's going to be cast out. And so really, uh, they begin to see the effects of their sin and their disobedience in the garden because sin has consequences. We, we know that and we see that. In verse number 9, I want to pick up reading there. and get, read. I want to read first of all down to verse 15, and we'll stop there, and then uh, we'll go from there if we have time. Verse number 9, the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not, am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Now let's go, let's look at verses 16 and 17. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch, and he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. So, we begin to see this godless society, this secular society of Cain, 
And as you look in chapter 4, not everything's chronological. You know, we won't always put, we won't always know the answers to everything, and, and this is A, B, C, D, and sometimes it doesn't follow that way. The, the writer skips uh, over here and then comes back, and that's kind of what we see in chapter 4 because it begins to talk about uh, the first civilization, Canaanites, the, the Canaanite civilization under Cain, but then he goes and talks about uh, Adam and Eve giving birth to Seth, which would have taken place before that. So it's not in chronological order. And some of these things, we, we know people put things in here to try to make it fit their uh, puzzle, so to speak. And, and really, you can't do that. And, and so we'll look at the text of Scripture tonight, and we'll try to explain the best we can. But, but going back to verse 9, the Lord came unto Cain. And I think all through this, we see God's grace and God's mercy and God's love as as God came to Cain, and he gave Cain an opportunity to repent of his sin. He gave him an opportunity for a second chance to right the wrong he had done. And he said, you know, Cain, I'll forgive you if you come and bring the right offering. But he said, if not, sin, sin's waiting at the door. It's waiting to pounce on you and destroy you. And, of course, that's what we see what happened. Cain was silent. He refused God's mercy. He refused his grace. He refused to repent. And, and what was in his heart came out that darkened soul, it came out on his face, it came out in his actions, and he took his brother out and he killed him. Of course, God saw that, and God heard the cry of Abel, his blood crying from the ground. And so we see here that, uh, that Cain's trying to get out of this. He says, well, I don't know where he's at. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, he knew where he was. He lied to God. And, and you know, we've already seen many sins of Cain. We've seen anger and jealousy and rage and envy. We've seen uh, deception. We've seen murder. Now he's lying to God. He's, he's ignored and rejected God's word and God's warning. He's, he's going about doing things his own way. And that, that's what people do. You know, we see in Israel. Israel's was exiled. They wandered, much like Cain is going to do. And so that's what happens when people, when they uh, get estranged from the Lord and they separate themselves from the Lord. They want to go their own way. They want to hide from God. They don't want to be in church. They don't want to be in the word of God. They don't want to pray. They don't want to be around Christian people. They want to get as far away from God as they possibly can. And I think that's what we see Cain doing right here. He, he once again is making excuses, playing the blame game, much like his parents had done. And so he, he's saying basically to God, I don't know where he's at. I'm not responsible for him. You know, he, he's, he's a grown man. He can take care of himself. I'm not his preserver, his protector. I'm not his guardian. And so I really don't know where he's at. Of course, if you take the Bible literally, I don't think there's other people on the earth right now but Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. So there's not a whole lot of people to go around and think, well, he's gone off with someone else because I don't think there's anyone else around. And so uh, God saw this, God knew, but God's coming uh, to seek repentance from Cain. But Cain didn't want anything to do with that. And he said in verse 10, what hast thou done? Remember he asked Eve the same thing back in chapter 3. says, the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Now, before we move on, I want to, uh, there's a passage of scripture that I didn't get to today, but Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 24, if you'll turn over there quickly with me, I just have a couple of passages I want to look at tonight other than Genesis, but Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 24, it talks about Abel. Abel's mentioned uh, several times as we saw today, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4, the testimony of Abel where, his, where he still speaks though he's dead, and really Abel never speaks in scripture. But his testimony continues of his faith, of, of what he did. We see the first person in that hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4. But Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. And so what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, is, is Abel's blood speaks of murder committed, conviction of sinners. But the blood of Jesus Christ speaks of better things because it speaks of redemption and salvation. It offers forgiveness and not vengeance. But Abel's blood there in verse number 10 of Genesis chapter 4, it's crying out for justice. It's crying out uh, that, that God would take care of what Cain had done. And uh, even though Abel doesn't speak verbally in the book of Genesis, his voice cries out from the ground uh, for justice, for justification, for vindication, whatever you want to say there. And, and God hears that. God knows what's going on. And so I, I think it shows here that God is concerned with us. God knows us when we're alive or when we're dead on this earth. God knows that. But aren't you thankful that before Abel died, that he brought an offering to God in faith? He was saved, wasn't he? I mean, that, that's salvation right there, what we saw today. He brought this offering in faith. We read Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. By faith he brought this offering that is pointing to this substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the blood offering that covers his sin. He believed that, and so he had faith. And, you know, that's what we do today. That's how we believe. 
When Jesus died on a cross for our sins, he shed his blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. There's no forgiveness. And by faith, we believe that, that we place our faith and our trust in Christ that what he did on the cross takes care of my sin. It gives me eternal life. But we have to make that effective. We have to believe that. We have to accept Christ into our heart, into our life. And that's what Abel did. Even though he didn't know Christ, Christ was years off, so to speak, his coming to the earth. But by faith he did that, and he died. So do you expect to see Abel in heaven? Sure you do. He, he, he saved by faith, so to speak. And, and then we continue on with our passage here. Now, verse number 11, there's consequences for Cain's actions. We see the first human being to be cursed. Now, remember, earlier we saw where the ground was cursed. The cry came from the ground, the same ground that was cursed because of Adam's sin. But we see here the serpent has been cursed, and then we see the ground has been cursed. Now Cain is cursed. It says here, and now art thou cursed from the earth. Now that's interesting there because what was Cain's livelihood? Well, it was the earth. He was a farmer. He was a tiller of the ground. He worked the land. He, he, he brought produce and, and grew crops and so forth. That was his livelihood, and that's cursed because of what he's done, because of his sin right there. All throughout the Bible. You see, folks, every time you see the Bible, you see there are consequences for your actions. There are consequences for sin. Many times people think, well, I'm getting by with this, or God's not going to see this, or God's not going to know this, or, or God's going to wink at this and allow this to go by. There are consequences for our sins. Now, if you're saved tonight, you're not going to stand before God and answer for all your sins because at Calvary, your sins were taken care of. Amen? They're washed away. They're taken care of. Now, when we sin after we're saved, we confess that sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, continue doing that, so we're thankful for that. But here Cain is cursed from the earth, his livelihood, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. Once again, we see those two little words, thy brother. And I think it's emphasizing here the enormity, uh, the horrendous factor that who he's killed. He's killed his brother, his own flesh and blood. And, you know, I mentioned a couple times today they came from the same background, the same family, the same parent, same experiences, uh, same culture. One went one way, one went the other way. And it was what was in the heart that came out. Abel's heart was right with God. It showed. Cain's heart was not right with God, and it showed. Then we see here in verse number 12, it says, When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth or, or not any more yield unto thee her strength. It's not going to produce crops for you. No matter how hard you work, no matter how much you plant, it's not going to produce for you. So there are consequences there. Cain was a farmer, so his livelihood's going to be affected there. You're not going to have produce. You're not going to have a livelihood here. But in verse number 12, God says, A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. Now, you know, that goes later to talk about the nation of Israel. What did Israel do? Israel disobeyed God. They rebelled against God. They turned to other gods. They didn't worship God the way that he told them to worship. So what happened to Israel? Well, Israel went into exile. Israel wandered in the wilderness. So you see here a foreshadow of the nation of Israel, I think, in the person of Cain right here. Cain disobeyed God. He came to God his way instead of God's way. He didn't offer the appropriate sacrifice. He didn't, he didn't do what he was supposed to do. So he's exiled so to speak, from the land, from, from the garden there. And he's, re, he's going to be removed farther away than Adam is from the garden. So it's showing here his sin's pretty bad, consequences to his actions. So he's going to be a fugitive and a vagabond, shalt thou be in there. He's going to be a wanderer. He's going to be a restless soul. He's going to be troubled, no rest and no peace, away from God. And, and this, is, this is his life right here. And he had it pretty good where he was. You know, they were outside the Garden of Eden, but they're probably close to the Garden of Eden. God was taking care of them, had everything he needed. All he had to do was obey God. But he thought, you know what? I'm going to do my own thing my own way. That's kind of what Satan wants you to do. That's what Satan does. That's what he wants you to do as an unbeliever. Don't follow God. Don't listen to God. Don't ask for repentance. Don't ask for forgiveness. Go ahead and do your own thing. Be your own boss. Be, be, be your, you know, determine your own destiny. That's what Cain wanted to do. But what you see in verse 13, was Cain sorry for his actions? Was he... Uh, was he remorseful? Was he re did he regret this? Was he sorry for his sin? Or was he just sorry he got caught? Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Now I want you to notice the pronouns there. Cain said unto the Lord, My, that's a pronoun, My punishment is greater than I can bear. And what I see there in the scripture, I see 
Cain's selfishness right there. Remember I mentioned this morning, he, he's not as concerned about Abel. Abel, his brother, just died. He just beat him to death right there, bleeding and dying right there in a field. And, 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 and he didn't think about his parents, Adam and Eve. They had lost a son, and the one killed him had been the other son. He didn't think about that. He didn't think about anything like that. All he was thinking about, it seemed like, was, what am I going to lose? I'm going to have to go out and be a wonder and a vagabond. God, you're being unfair. God, you're being too harsh. God, you're being too severe. I don't deserve this, okay? You're, you're punishing me too greatly. I, I, I don't need this. I don't deserve this. So he's more concerned about himself right here. And, you know, that's really where sin begins. Sin is selfishness. It's doing what you want to do, when you want to do it, how you want to do it. You're not going to answer to anyone. You're not accountable to anyone. You're not, uh, you're not held responsible to anyone. And so that's Cain because he, he complains to God right here. Now, Cain should have been mad at himself and asked for forgiveness. He should have said, God, I'm sorry that I've sinned. I didn't bring the appropriate sacrifice. I killed my brother, and I've sinned against you. And you know what? I think God would have forgiven him, amen? But, but he didn't do that, did he? He came here, and, he, and he's worried about himself. God, my punishment's greater than I can bear. My, th this punishment's too great. It, it, it's too severe. You need to lighten up on me a little bit, okay? I don't need this great punishment right here. Yeah, I, I committed a sin, but we see his complaint right here. Now, in verse 14, he continues on. He says, Behold, he says, Thou hast driven me. Now, notice the pronouns again. He's using himself. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth. And from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. So who's he concerned about? He's concerned about himself. He's not concerned about Abel. He's not concerned about his parents. He's not concerned about his relationship with God. He's concerned about what he's going to lose. He's concerned about his consequences and what's going to happen to him instead of what's happened to someone else. What is it? That's selfishness. That, that, that's selfishness right there. That's pride. That's arrogance. That's selfishness. That's what we see with sin. I'm not worried who it's going to affect. I'm not worried who it's going to hurt or harm. I'm just concerned. Am I going to have a good time? Am I going to have pleasure? I'm not worried about anyone else. Now, we start getting in some interesting questions here. And I'll tell you right as we get in here, I don't have all the answers, okay? So you might look at me and think, well, you're supposed to be the preacher. You're supposed to know every answer in the Bible. If I did, you know what? I, during the week, I'd lay out uh, on the beach somewhere. I'd go down to Boonesboro. I think they still have a beach down there. I'd go down and lay out on the beach all week and say, you know what? I'll just pop up Sunday morning and read a few words and talk a little bit. Now, you have to study. And what you see here, there's some things... The Bible really doesn't tell us. So look at verse 15, uh, 14. He says, uh, I shall be a fugitive, vagabond on the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. Now, who's he talking about here? Is he talking about his parents? Those are the ones still remaining. You know, there's four people on the earth. Abel's dead now. Well, you know, there's a couple different interpretations of this. Some people believe that uh, there was another race of people other than Adam and Eve, that they were somewhere else on the earth and, and that God created them. And, and you know, there, there's a large population here that Adam and Eve just happened to be in the Garden of Eden, and that's what the biblical story uh, focuses on. But there's other people. I don't really hold to that because I don't really think the Bible talks about that. So I don't really believe that because I don't think you see that in Scripture. Now, the two possible interpretations here, Adam and Eve had other, uh, other children, okay? Now, Maybe some time had passed, there were other children born. You look at Seth, you think, well, was Seth the third son? Well, he could have been the third son. He could have been on down the line. He's the promised one to take the place of Abel. So it could have been that Adam and Eve had more children by this time, and, and the population was starting to grow up on the earth. And so, but, but I think also you're looking at anticipation of uh, the human population growing. Remember, he knew Adam and Eve were going to have a lot of children. God had told Eve, you're going to have a seed. You're going to be the mother of all living. Adam named his wife Eve. And so when you look at that, it's maybe an anticipation of more human beings to come. And so, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to answer there. The Bible really doesn't go in and tell us a lot of things. So basically what we're doing, we're speculating. It's your opinion, my opinion, whatever. You may have opinion. But as far as another race of people, I don't really see that because I think God deals with Adam and Eve. I think those are the first two human beings. And I think every single person on this earth has come from Adam and Eve. I think that's if you take the Bible literally, which is the way I do. I think that's where you get that, okay? So, but maybe he's anticipating. People are going to kill him. You know, these, these relatives of mine, these brothers and sisters, they're going to hear about this, and, and they're going to they're want me for revenge. But look what the Lord said in verse 15. 
Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, uh, now that's in a future tense, so that's why I think it's maybe an anticipation. It's a future tense. Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. It means seven times greater than Cain's punishment. If, you try, if someone out there later on down the years tries to kill Cain for killing Abel, their, their punishment's going to be seven times greater than what Cain's punishment was. So God is, is taking care of Cain. Remember, throughout this, we see God's judgment, but we see God's mercy and his grace and his love. Folks, you see that throughout all the Bible. Amen? You see God's judgment, but you always see God's love and his grace and his mercy. When God dealt with the nation of Israel, there's judgment, there's condemnation, but there's always love and grace and mercy. When God deals with us as sinners, there's judgment on sin, but there's always grace and love and mercy. You see that throughout the Bible. That's, that's a thread that goes throughout all the Bible. That's what you see here in the very first book of the Bible. There's God's judgment, but there's also God's mercy. God's going to protect Cain. He, 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 said, he said, I'm going to put a mark upon you that anyone finding you, should, that way they won't kill you. And I think in the future. And what you see here, you think, well, what was the mark of Cain? What was this? Well, there's different, different speculations, different interpretations. They say, well, was his, was his skin darkened to a different color or was he uh, have some mark? It, 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 evidently, it's some visible mark. It's the same word that's used in the book of Revelation for the mark of the beast. It's a visible mark. It's an, uh, an identifiable mark uh, that God is protecting Cain that God is taking care of Cain, that anyone that tries to harm Cain or kill Cain will be put to death. What's the mark? Once again, the Bible really doesn't tell us, so it's mere speculation what that is, but it's some type of identifiable mark or visible mark placed upon Cain that he's going to be protected. Now, what do you see there? You see God's mercy, God's grace, God's love. And you know, the question always comes up here, why would God allow a murderer to live? Why would he allow murder to live? Why, why would he do that? Cain disobeyed God. He's angry. He's jealous. He, he, he didn't repent of his sins. He didn't, he didn't ask for forgiveness. He didn't confess his sins. He didn't do anything. He disobeyed God. And, and then he came and, and was kind of sarcastic. Am I my brother's keeper? I'm not responsible for my brother. But God spared his life. And we wonder, well, why did God do that? Well, that's another question. I can't answer. That, that's God's sovereign will. God's choice and God's will. You see, life and death are his prerogatives, okay? God is the giver of life and God is the taker of life. We hear the same things today, especially as a pastor, you hear that. Why did this person live and why did this person die? Why was this person, you healed him in the past, but this time you didn't heal him? Those things I can't answer, folks. I don't know the mind of God. And that's the sovereign will of God. But let me tell you something. And get this in your mind. God makes no mistake. There are no accidents with God, okay? We have trust. That's where we have trust God. That's where we have to have faith. I don't know why God spared his life, but God spared his life, okay? He's going to set up a civilization here that's a godless society, that's a secular society. And so why God did this, I don't know. You know, you're thinking, well, if I was God, I would have taken care of him and punish him. Of course, the law is not in act now. You know, you're going to see later on the law of capital punishment. You don't have that right now, okay? But, but he did sin, but God spared his life. And so he set this mark up on Cain because, remember, the Bible says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Now, we're going to go a little deeper here. I'm usually out of time, but I actually have plenty of time tonight, so we may get into the book of Deuteronomy tonight. Amen? I'm just joking. We'll get maybe to Leviticus or something. So. But in verse 16, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. Now, that's a very sad statement. You see that? Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. Why did he do it? God gave him opportunity to repent. God gave him opportunity. He said, I'll forgive you. If you just bring the right, right sacrifice, if you just do the right thing, I'll forgive you, Cain. Even though you've sinned, even though you've had anger and jealousy and deception and murder and lying, I'll still forgive you if you'll just come and do what I ask you to do. But he said, I'm not going to do it. He was silent. His heart was hardened. And so the Bible says here, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. And you know this next section here down through verse 24, it shows what happens, folks, when a society is away from the presence of the Lord. It's a godless society. We're going to see people in Cain's family that, that are recognized for their achievements, uh, animal husbandry and arts and crafts and musicians 
and uh, metal workers and metallurgy and all these different things like that, but there's no mention of God in there. Now remember, this is not chronological because you're going to come back and have the birth of sin. And so, and Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Now this was a land that was east of Eden. It doesn't necessarily mean there were people already there. Now, there could have been another civilization. I don't really hold to that, as I mentioned. But the land of Nod, Nod means a wanderer. It means rootless. It means restless. And so that's what Cain's going to be. He's going to be a vagabond, a homeless fugitive. He's going to be a wanderer on the earth. So what does he do to try to get back at God and say, God, you've got me out here wandering, but I'm going to try to redeem myself, and I'm going to show you I'm not going to be a wanderer. What did he do? He goes down and he builds a city. It says in verse 17, Cain knew his wife, and she conceived to bear Enoch, and he built a city. This is Cain built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. Now, this isn't a city what we think of today with large buildings, courthouse, and all this stuff, but permanent dwellings right here, okay? And he builds a city right there to keep himself from wandering around. This is more of a permanent dwelling. So it's almost like he's trying to get back at God and say, well, God, I'll show you. You think I'm going to be a wanderer? I'll build a city right here. But, of course, this city leads on down the line, I think, later to the Tower of Babel, to Nimrod, and it's a godless society right here. But then we have another good question. I told you I was going to give you some good questions tonight. I didn't have anyone answer this when they came in tonight, but uh, you know the question. Where did Cain get his wife? Where did his wife come from? Now, time has elapsed some. There's more sons and daughters. You see in chapter 5, I think verse 3 or 4, talks about Adam and Eve having more sons and daughters. So, And, of course, we're going to see a genealogy here which moves forward, and then we come back in verse 25. So remember, it's not chronological. First city mentioned in the Bible, but said Cain knew his wife. Now, was this from another civilization? I don't think so. You know, it, it's obvious to me that it had to be a sister or a niece or something. You say, well, that's gross or that's incest or whatever. Well, you have to look at this time, folks. Listen, there wasn't anybody else on the earth, okay? And so they had to intermarry right there. And now you have to remember, the reason you don't have that today is because of that genetic pool. You know, it, it's tainted. It's polluted because of sin. Sin was just taking effect in the human race, okay? You didn't have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of sin, of the curse of, of man in a fallen world. So at this time, everything was pretty pure, okay? So you didn't have those genetic mistakes and that genetic pollution and so forth. And so he would have had to marry one of his sisters or, or perhaps a niece or something. So it, it would have had to have been that way as the population starts right there. Now, God gives laws about that later on, but this is the beginning of civilization. So... I don't think he found a wife from some other civilization. I think it had to be a blood relative. But I want you to see once again God's mercy and God's grace and God's love. God said, Cain, if you come back, I'll forgive you. If you come back, I'll redeem you. If you bring the right offering, everything will be right. Remember, he killed his brother, and God came to him and said, I I'm going to punish you, Cain. There's going to be consequences. You're going to be cursed uh, from the earth here. You're not going to be able to grow. You're not going to be able to farm. You're going to be a wanderer. You're going to be a vagabond. I, but I'm going to put a mark on you so that no one will take vengeance on you. But then we see God's mercy and grace here. He's cast out in the presence of the Lord. But look in verse 17. His wife conceived and bare a son. Now, we don't have the name of Cain's wife. And you come up with a name you find a name for, let me know. I don't know who it is. The Bible doesn't tell us. But I think we see once again God's grace that God's continuing his line. And you see the line of Cain is going to be the ungodly line. The, Cain, the line of Seth is going to be that godly line because Seth is going to be the one, the substitute for Abel. Now remember, Eve may have thought when Cain was born that this is the promised seed. This is, this is the deliverer right here. But she soon found out that's not the case because what Cain did to his brother Abel. Maybe when Abel was born, she thought, you know, maybe this is the promised seed. And then we're going to see Seth. But look in verse 17. Cain knew Eve's wife, or Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. So you begin to see here recognition. You begin to see in, in this passage here uh, earthly achievements, okay? And that's what that society is all about. That's the Canidic, or Cainitic civilization right there. It's all about them. There's no mention of God. Look at these next few verses. Verse 18, and Enoch, and at the Enoch was born Erod, and Erod beget Mahujahel, and Mahujahel beget Methusahel, 
and Methuselah beget Lamech. Boy, I'm glad I don't have to say those a bunch of times in a row. Lamech right here. This is the seventh from Adam, okay? And, and, and you're going to see he, he's a scoundrel. Look at Lamech. Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Adah, and the name of the other was Zillah. You see right there, just within a few generations, you see that they've already started to disobey God's idea of marriage. It's not something in the 21st century, folks. It happened all the way back there at the beginning of time, and you see these are Cainites. These are descendants of Cain. Now, you know, when you look in the Bible, and we'll see as we go along in the book of Genesis, many of these people lived a long time. Adam was 130 years old when Seth was born, okay? You guys thought you were old. You just spring chicken, okay? A lot of these people lived seven, eight, nine hundred years because the population was not as great. You, you didn't have all the diseases and so forth. And now you begin to see after the flood, the years beginning to be shortened. And when you see this, did that person actually live 930 years or 850 years? Well, if you take the Bible literally, yes, they did. Couldn't you imagine a birthday cake? Putting the candles on there? Boy, you think you're old when you're 60 or 70. I'm sorry, okay? Putting those candles on there, you imagine 900 and something? But, but I want you to notice here, God's mercy because Cain has descendants right here. You know, Cain is able to have children right here. And so Lamech took him to two wives. And Adon, verse 20, bore Jabel. He was the father of such as dwell in tents and such as have cattle. So animal husbandry and nomadic tents and so forth, wonder. And his brother's name was Jubal. Now, Jubal was the father of all such as handled the harp and organ, the musician, stringed and winged instruments. And Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain. You notice they bring the name Cain back in here. And when these people lived a long time, you could have lived to seen a, a great, 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 great grandchild, okay? You know, today we get to the great, and that's about it. Sometimes you have a great, great, but they would have seen a lot of that. It, it, Zillah bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron, was a metal worker. Not only made uh, tools for agriculture and construction, but I think also weaponry. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Naama. Verse 23 and 24 is what's known as the Song of the Sword. It's Hebrew poetry. And Lamech said unto his wives, Adon Zillah, hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, seventy and sevenfold. I want you to see that right there. Were the sins of the parents affecting the children? If you say yes, you got it right. It's yes. I want you to see right there. Lamech in the line and the descendancy of this ungodly line of Cain, he marries two women. You see the first case in the Bible recorded of polygamy, or actually bigamy right here, more than one wife. That was not God's idea for marriage. Just a few generations and people are disobeying God's idea of marriage. Sin is beginning to infiltrate and beginning to take over in this line right here, this ungodly line. Not only is Lamech marrying two wives, but then Lamech comes and says, evidently he killed someone. He said, well, I didn't kill in self-defense like Cain did, or, or, or Cain killed in premeditated. I was more in self-defense. You know, Cain's was plotted, it was deliberate, it was premeditated. He took his brother out in the field and he killed him. And, and Lamech's thinking, you know what, I didn't do that. Mine was more in self-defense. But we see here he marries two women, and then we see here he kills somebody. So you see the sin continuing on in the generation right there? And then his pride and his arrogancy here. He says, you know what? I have this weaponry that my son made, Tubal Cain, and, and I'm invincible, and I'm stronger than God, and I'm stronger than this person. No one's going to bother me. And if someone bothers me, you know, Cain's, uh, avenger is, is going to be punished seven times. If someone avenges me, someone revenge comes after me and tries to kill me, their punishment's going to be 77 times greater. Jesus uses that later, doesn't he? About forgiving someone that many times. But what we see right here, and I'm going to stop right here. I'm not going to get into Seth tonight because I have a little more to do with Seth. But I want you to notice here. It all goes back to Cain's heart. Cain refused to repent. He refused to confess his sin. He refused God's mercy and his grace and his love. And I think the reason you have this in Genesis 4, it's to show us right here, here's the result of sin in a family. The mother and father sin, it's passed on down to the children, it's passed to the grandchildren, it's passed to the great-grandchildren. And you know what that shows me today? In the generation we live in today, 
It's saddened today, folks, that we're raising a, a generation of children and youth that don't go to church. Do you know that? We're losing a generation of children. We're using, losing a generation of youth. You know, I have to talk with a pastor that I did a funeral with Monday. He's talking the same thing about his youth. He says, you know, they work, they go here, they do this, they're busy. He said, we're, lo we're, we're, talking, we're losing a generation of youth. And you see the results of that right there? When you see there, you see great earthly achievements. Oh, there's great animal husbandry. There's arts and crafts and musicians. And, and, and there's metal workers and metallurgy. And they're building cities and, and great civilizations and different things like that. But when you see that down 16 through 24, there's no mention whatsoever. There's no mention of God. You see that? Now, if we had time tonight, we'd look at Seth. Men begin to call upon the name of the Lord in Seth's line. That's the godly line. Okay, so you really, you're getting... You're starting to see two groups of people. You see, Satan tried to kill and destroy the promise seed, that lion leading to the promise seed with Abel. But God's going to replace Abel with Seth. But you begin to see two types of people here. You begin to see those who are indifferent to sin and evil, the line of Cain. And then you begin to see those who call upon the name of the Lord in the line of Seth. Listen, folks, it hasn't changed today. It hasn't changed one bit. You see what happens generation. This one begins to sin. This one's ne next generation, a little more sin. Next generation, they get a little further away from God, a little more sin. Next generation, it just continues and continues and continues. You know, you think in our generation day, our grandparents' generation, they went to church. They went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Tuesday night, whatever they had Sunday, they went to church. And then parents' generation, they went to church. My generation started getting away. They thought, well, you know, we can go either way here. The next generation after us, our ch my children's generation, Starting to go away from the Lord. And then you can imagine the next generation because, folks, if children aren't in church today, are they going to bring their children to church? Are they going to bring their grandchildren to church? That's what you see in the line of Cain. And we're going to see there's great results there. There's great consequences there. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. He said, I'm, I'm through. I refuse that. I'm going to start my own civilization. I'm going to do my own thing, my own way. And you see what happens down the line. There's bigamy. There's polygamy. There's murder. And it's going to lead all the way down there to the Tower of Babel where they build this tower and they say, you know, we're, we're going to rebel against God. And God has to do something. He scatters the nations. He scatters them. He confuses their tongues. But you begin to see two lines. You see the seed of the woman and the seed of Satan. It all goes back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. If I just had about two more hours, I would continue. But I know you don't want to listen to me one more minute, more or less two hours. And so I'm going to stop right there. But as I mentioned, we see God's judgment, but thank God, throughout this passage, there's always God's mercy and there's God's grace. His grace is always sufficient. Will you bow with me tonight? Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you for your word and we thank you for this passage of scripture tonight. And Father, just help us as we look through Genesis, that we might learn, that we might apply these truths to our lives, that we not only look at this as, as biblical history and, and the narrative here, and we look at the text of Scripture, but Father, help us to, to apply these truths to our life, that we see that really the time then is not much different than what it is today, that there's still sin, there's still murder, there's still rebellion, there's still problems in marriage, there's still people that do not follow you, there's still people that flee from you. But then we begin to see there's still people that do follow you, that do obey you, that do worship you. And so really in these thousands of years, however much time it's been, it's not really that different. And Father, help us tonight and help us throughout these sermons and these lessons to learn, to learn what you would have us to do, how we approach you and how we serve you and how we worship you. Because everything we do here, Lord, it's not for our recognition, but it's for your honor and for your glory, that, that others might come to know you, that people might be saved. Father, I pray tonight, if there's even one here tonight that's never received Christ, may they realize uh, that Jesus died for them, was buried, and rose again. And may they, like Abel, place their faith in a sacrifice, a substitute, the, an innocent life dying for the guilty, so the guilty might go free. Father, if we, just, we give this time to you, that uh, people to respond tonight, and we just pray that you'll move in our midst. Help us throughout this week, Lord, to serve you, to get out and to share Christ, to get out and invite people to church. And just to get out and just to honor and glorify you. Because as we see that, Lord, you're worthy. You deserve it. Forgive us of our sin, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with me tonight?